How's it going class? This is going to be our week four lecture. So just like before, I'm going to sit here. I'm going to watch the video from last semester. Um, I'm talking about mood disorders. So this is going to be bipolar one and two. So I'm going to sit here. I'm going to watch the video. And if anything comes to mind, I'm going to jump in. Once again, you're not required to watch this video. You can go into the old videos folder in the week four folder in Compass and then watch my, you know, my lecture from last semester. So you don't have to watch this video. Um, this is just something that I wanted to do just in case I missed anything or wanted to increase the content. I have to say that every week for reasons. OK, so so let me go ahead and get this started. But of course, as per the usual, before we start our video, we need to have a brief message from our corporate sponsors. Are you tired of your dead-end job? Are you sick and tired of looking at computer screens trying to figure out what to do? Do you spend copious amounts of time questioning your decisions? Do you have a hard time reading the syllabus or wondering why doesn't he just answer my emails? If this is true, then you should try caffeine. Caffeine is 100% natural. It's grown in the ground. It's totally good for you. It makes you sharp and focused. It gives you the opportunity to think. Also, caffeine will help you make friends. Caffeine will make you the most popular person at the cafe. Caffeine is really good. It can be had cold and hot. Caffeine grows everywhere and it's super cheap. Everybody, you should get your hands on caffeine from the makers of caffeine. Okay. There's no corporate sponsors. There are no corporate sponsors. There never have been, there never will be. We're not sponsored by anybody. All right, so let's go ahead and get this started. Hey, how's it going class? So this is gonna be our week four lecture. We are going to cover mood disorders. This is our second mood disorders unit. Now let's go ahead and get right into it. This is the section where we go over mania and bipolar disorder. So we're gonna go over the symptoms, the etiology, the epidemiology and intervention. All right, so let's get started by talking about the symptoms. All right, so mania is going to be characterized by a distinct period of persistently elevated, expansive, or irritable mood. Elevated mood as euphoria, being euphoric. So this is where somebody has an exaggerated feeling of physical or emotional well-being, as opposed to like depressed mood. So depressed mood is dysphoric, but elevated mood is euphoric. Dystopia, utopia dysphoric, euphoric. That's how you're going to remember that. So expansive means like high energy, being unaffected by the environment. So this is somebody who's always on the go, no matter what happens, they're always on that high level. Being irritable, we all know what that is, irritation. So I'm familiar with that. So during this period of elevated or expansive mood, you're going to need three additional symptoms, four additional symptoms if you just have irritable mood. Elevated, expansive mood, you need three additional symptoms. If you just have irritable mood, you're going to need four additional symptoms. So these symptoms must be present to a degree where it is noticeable and significantly different from normal behavior. So these symptoms take the form of inflated self-esteem or grandiosity. So this is someone being, you know, feeling like they're better than others, feeling like they're invincible, um, being overly self-confident to the point that other people start to take notice. So you have like decreased need for sleep. So this is somebody who is feeling rested after only three hours of sleep. Typically, individuals need anywhere from six to eight hours of sleep. Some have more, some have less. If you normally sleep six hours a night and then all of a sudden you start sleeping three hours a night, that could be an indication of mania. An individual in a manic episode might be more talkative than usual or have like this pressure to keep talking. This is going to be referred to as pressured speech. People talking to this individual might have a hard time trying to get a word in edgewise. And also there might be some like they might like so many words as individuals trying to say that they kind of like all jumble together at once and they just like flow out. So this is going to be someone who's just talking very fast, whole lot of speech, doesn't really make a lot of sense. Flight of ideas or a subjective experience of having your thoughts racing. It's a little bit different from the pressure to speak. Someone with racing thoughts um, doesn't necessarily have to have pressured speech. The racing thoughts, this is going to be the subjective experience of having like a flight of ideas, you know, thinking about things at a million miles an hour, distractibility, tension being, you know, moved from one thing to the next, you know, just like, oh, you're thinking about this and you're thinking about that. An individual might experience heightened motivation. This could be in, an increase in goal-directed activity. This could happen at work, at school, socially, 
sexually. This could also include psychomotor agitation, you know, moving around a lot, uh, making a lot of, uh, you know, meaningless motions. An individual could also experience impulsivity. So this could be involvement in activities that have a high potential for painful, painful consequences. So this kind of risky behavior could be things from engaging in very strange business ventures, like opening an ant hotel. Uh, you could have somebody going on buying sprees. Maybe they're a student, but you just saw they bought a $5,000 TV and they took out a student loan for it. Because someone with sexual indiscretions, this is like having a lot of unprotected sex or a change in sexual behavior. So these are all things known as impulsivity that can be associated with a manic episode. So next up, we're going to watch a video with Mary. Uh, we saw Mary before when she was in the middle of a depressive episode, and now this is going to be Mary in the middle of a manic episode. So we'll play a little bit of the video and the rest will be posted on Compass. All right, yeah, just, just like before, uh, these full videos are on Compass. I would definitely encourage you to go to the study videos page on Compass and watch some of those. Now, um, I was having office hours and some people were talking about how they haven't been watching the study videos. Typically, when you're here in, um, when you're in college, there is this thing called the formula to academic success. So that's for every credit hour you're registered in the class, you spend two to three hours outside of class working on that, on that course. So for example, this is a three credit hour course. So you should spend anywhere from six to nine hours outside of class um, studying uh, material for this course. You might be saying to yourself, well, Walter, these lecture videos are like an hour a piece. I mean, you know, does that count? It's like, no, that doesn't count. That's like, so that would be like your time in class. Like, for example, if we were having normal lectures. Now, usually, um, and during the semester, we're meeting three hours per week. But with these video formats, because no one's asking questions, we're not having conversations, get through the material really quick. So there's about two hours of experience that you're missing out on per week. And I try to fill that in with some of these study videos, with some of these additional content for you to watch, um, with, uh, with these type of videos for you to have like, you know, um, you know, more conversation. Um, I have like those two hours office hours rather than just one hour. You know, some people have half an hour one day, half an hour the other day. I put two hours back to back on, on a single day to try to facilitate conversation. So if you're really not watching these study videos, if you're not asking course questions via email, then you're getting into a situation where you're missing out on some of the experience. Um, so I can't really replicate a three hour lecture um, experience online because people ask questions People, we have conversations, there's a didactic, and you know, it, it's, it's fun. And now with this setup, you're either watching these videos or not. So I would encourage you to hop on the compass, look at the study videos, watch those. And you know, if you're gonna send me an email, send me an email about content of the course, right? Like, talk to me about depression, talk to me about bipolar disorder. You know, the, the reason why I don't want to answer syllabus questions is a waste of everybody's time. You should be reading the syllabus or read the syllabus. Everything's on the front page of Compass. If you're going to contact me, let's talk about the course. Let's enrich your learning experience. But I'm going to leave that up to you. Remember, kids, a C is a degree. Well, Mary, I'm glad you could come back. Can you say how you're feeling this morning? Oh, on top of the world. Okay. Hoo, 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 on top of the world. Uh -huh. What are your plans for today? Oh, it's just going to be one great day. What are you going to do? Well, God, whatever my doctor says I can do, I should say that right now. Tell me a little bit about that. You mean there's, you may have some restrictions? Yeah, still. Uh -huh. I went off with my husband last night. I beat him up. What? No, tell me about that. Well, I wanted him out of there. He so, came to visit? Yeah, he came to visit me. Okay. And he pissed me off, so I wanted him out of there, so I beat him up. Now, what do you mean you beat him up? I forcibly beat him up. You hit him? Quite a few times, oh yeah, slugging mm -hmm. it out. You were saying something earlier about Jesus Christ and the CIA. Okay, I'm in, I'm in incognito for the Lord, God Almighty, mm -hmm. Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm working for him. I okay. have been for years. Now what do you mean incognito? I'm a spy. And, and what, what's your mission? My mission is to Fight for the American way. Can you say more about it? 
The Statue of Liberty. Okay. But, I mean, can you talk more about the kinds of things that you have to do or, or have been doing as part of that mission? Oh, I can bring up the wind. I can bring the rain. I can bring the sunshine. I can do lots of things through Christ who strengthens me. Okay. I mean, you can actually cause the wind to come up? Oh, yes. Could you do that today if you sure. wanted to? Sure. Oh, yeah. And, and, and what gives you the power to do that? God. On our walk down, you were mentioning about the air and the smells, and we saw some flowers. You like the outdoors? I love the outdoors. It's my favorite place to be is outdoors. Yeah. Well, see, when I first met my husband, can I just talk? Sure, please. When I first met my husband, we lived underneath a bridge and down at a boat dock. We weren't married. Mm -hmm. But I believe we got married in the eyes of God down at this boat dock mm -hmm. because he popped my cherry, and I had been married before. When we first sat down, uh, we asked if you could take your gum out, and you had some strong feelings about that. I've chewed it since I was a little bit of a kid. Mm -hmm. Don't hurt my teeth or nothing. I've got strong teeth, and I like hard gum. Mm -hmm. I like to blow bubbles with it. Okay. Is that a good piece? Yeah, it's a real good piece. Okay. You want a piece? No, thanks. <laughs> So. <laughs> so we're gonna have another video here with John. So John is a little bit different from Mary, but he also has, or he's also in the middle of a manic episode. So let's go ahead and watch this video. Um, keep an eye out for some of those symptoms we were talking about before. Hello there, Mr. Riley. Hello. You all right? Yeah. My yeah. name's Dr. Betty. Right. And I'm the right. psychiatrist. I'll come and see you because my GP sent me to see you, didn't yeah. you? She said, yeah. come, come and see a Trixarctist because then you'll be all right. Come and see a... Trixarctist, psychiatrist, yeah. Tri oh, right. You must okay. know that one. Yeah, he said, come yeah. and see you because you have time to listen to me. Yeah. He's not had time to listen to me, you see, because okay. he's, he's a GP, he's a right. doctor, but I don't think he's very clever. Can I just... He's not very clever because he's not. he's not... He's not Okay. Let me get, get, get into this, you see, won't let me right, talk okay. about this. Well, he talked this into it some time, but then, yeah, yeah, sometimes he doesn't. Can I just sometimes clarify why, why, why you're here and why I'm here? I'm, I'm the psychiatrist well, in the emergency you. clinic today, right, and okay. your GP's asked me to see right, you. Right, so is that's that, why I'm here. Is that that's, right? That's why I'm, yeah, because I've got to tell you about this. Okay, yeah, okay. And this, because there's important stuff in there, really, right. really important well, before stuff. Before we start with that, can I just ask you, what would you like me to call you, Mr. Riley? Names. Names are games. I don't bother with names. That's just stupid. Okay. Call me John. John. Yeah, okay. What's your name? Okay, I'm Dr. Betty. John. No, your proper name. Uh, my name you, is Doctor. No, your proper name. Your proper, your proper name's not Doctor. Uh, at work, I'm Dr. Betty. You're not you're Doctor. Doctor John. who? Doctor who? Diddly dang, waddly dang. Okay. <laughs> it's good day. Do you watch that? It's fantastic. That okay. Can now, I, now, what, what John, is... John, yeah, can no. I ask you, how, how old are you, John? Oh, oh, no, I'm only as old as a woman you feel, aren't you? Eh? <laughs> right, okay. You know, wait the man's heart is to his stomach. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah, fantastic. So, so how old would that make Food you, John? Food for the soul. Nice bit of soul, yeah. Right. Hey, no, a bit of fish. And I'm half hungry. You got right. any food? Any food round here? Uh, any, 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 any? Oi, down there, you got any food? I'm starving now. Nah. They won't be able to get you any food. Nah, let's, oh, shall we perhaps, I'll tell you what, okay, let's, nah, let's nah, perhaps let's, think about let's food get back to in this. a minute. Let's yes, get, yes, that's a good idea. This is important, this yeah. is why I'm going okay. to talk to you about this. Okay, tell, you what's tell, going me, on. tell me a bit about this then. Well, this is, this is the work I've been doing, you know, right. this is really important and it's, it's, uh, it's my cure for cancer. Okay. That's what it is, you know, it's, it's, all, it's all written down here. Right. Uh, well, it's not written down, it's here, and it's at home in my books. Right there we saw Mary, we saw John, they both displayed different symptoms. I hope that you were taking some notes, thinking about it, what kind of symptoms they were displaying. So let's take a look right here at this review question. So Mary and John have some similar symptoms of mania, although they are presented differently. Mary mentions special powers, talking about how she has the ability to control the weather, and John believes he has found the cure for cancer. So some might say that both experiences are manifestations of which symptom of mania. So is it going to be A, pressured speech, B, elevated mood, C, impulsivity, D, grandiosity, or E, impressionable ideas? A, B, C, D, E. All right, go ahead and pause. There we go. Here's the answer for you. All right, grandiosity. Remember, grandiosity, feeling like you're better than other people or that you have special powers. That's grandiosity. Some of these other symptoms, both of them did demonstrate pressured speech, elevated mood, impulsivity, but none of that is contained within this question. So this question is asking you specifically about these symptoms and what, what this means. So keep in mind, that was not just something that was present during the video, but specifically for this question, what is this question asking you? And of course, E, we know what E is. That's gobbledygook. I just threw that in there. All right, so now we're going to talk more about bipolar 1. So there are two bipolar disorders, bipolar 1, bipolar 2. 
Now for Bipolar 1, this is going to be characterized by at least one manic episode based on the symptoms that we described. So we often do see major depressive episodes in Bipolar 1, but major depressive episodes are not necessary for diagnosis. Now when we're looking at the list of symptoms for a manic episode, we want to make sure that these symptoms are causing social or occupational distress, impairment, or even uh, requiring hospitalization. So these symptoms are going to be pretty severe and they're going to cause a lot of problems in an individual's life. So it's not just like, oh, I woke up in the morning today and I feel really jazzed up. This is where all of a sudden I have this extreme change in behavior and it's causing problems in my life. So just like we talked about in the previous slides, when we were looking at the symptoms, a, a manic episode is going to be characterized by a period of persistent elevated and expansive mood or irritable mood. This must last for at least one week in order for it to be considered a manic episode. In addition to the persistent elevated or expansive mood, you're going to need three additional symptoms. If you just have the irritable mood, you need four additional symptoms. So when we think about mania, remember you're thinking about things like um, this euphoric mood, this extreme impulsivity, these racing thoughts, days without sleep is very extreme. Often mania involves impairment that can leave somebody financially devastated, particularly if you're like engaging like massive buying sprees or exhibiting like this kind of goal directed behavior where like you're going around trying to start a business in a few days or maxing out your credit cards to buy a bunch of things. These symptoms, you know, you have the grandiosity, the decreased need for sleep. The increased talkativeness, you have flight of ideas, racing thoughts, you have distractibility, you have an increase in goal-directed activity, psychomotor agitation, impulsivity. So thinking about a manic episode, you're raise, rising up its elevated mood, you have your manic episode, and then you're coming down. Now this port here, where you're coming down from the manic episode, this is going to be when you have your highest risk for suicidal ideation and suicide attempts. Now remember, when we were talking about depression, we were talking about how that change from either going into a depressive episode or coming out of a depressive episode is the highest risk for suicide and suicidal ideation. Same thing applies with mania. So just reviewing here. So with bipolar one disorder, we have at least one manic episode. These symptoms are going to cause social occupational distress or impairment. In order to meet criteria for mania, you need to have persistent, elevated, expansive, or irritable mood for at least one week and at least three of the other symptoms that we described. If you just have irritable mood, you need four additional symptoms. However you look at it, you need a total of five symptoms. So remember we're talking about bipolar one, we said you need a manic episode to meet criteria. And you could have a major depressive episode, but you didn't necessarily need a major depressive episode. Bipolar two requires a hypomanic episode, at least one, and at least one major depressive episode. Now you might be thinking to yourself, well, what is hypomania? Like, well, how's that different from mania? So look at the word. So you have mania, and then you have hypo. So what does hypo mean? You know, we've, we've, we've heard this before, right? We have like hypo, hyper, hypo, hyper, right? So hypo means beneath. Hypodermic needle, hypothermia, below. So hypomania is below mania. So this means the kind of distress, the kind of impairment, the severity of the symptoms is going to be less than mania. Bipolar 2 often involves an uncharacteristic change in a person's functioning, but it's typically not severe enough to cause marked uh, impairment in functioning or even require hospitalization. So hypomania is very similar to mania, except in terms of duration. So Mania lasts for a week. Well, hypomania needs to last for at least four days, but this is going to follow the same number of symptoms as mania. When you think about hypomania, we're just thinking about it as a less severe form of mania. So hypomania involves periods of creativity, increased energy, decreased sleep. As you can imagine, all of these are at to a lesser degree than mania. So when we're thinking about hypomania, we are still looking at the same symptoms. We're still looking at the grandiosity, the decreased need for sleep, the increased talkativeness, the racing thoughts, the distractibility, the psychomotor agitation, goal-directed activity, the impulsivity, 
and the core mood symptoms. Now remember, these core mood symptoms are persistent, elevated, expansive, or irritable mood. Now remember, if you have the elevated, expansive mood, you need three additional symptoms. If you have the irritable mood, you need four additional symptoms. And remember, this is going to be for a period of four days. Hypomania is a huge risk for mania. Now, some medications uh, for depression can actually cause a manic episode in people who would otherwise be hypomanic. So this is going to highlight the importance of assessing for hypomania when considering medication. Nice little chart. We're looking at bipolar 1, bipolar 2. Now remember, for bipolar 1, you need at least one manic episode. MDE is not necessary. So what is MDE? Major depressive episode. That's not necessary. Can you have a major depressive episode with bipolar 1? Yes. The answer is yes. But it is not necessary. We have the mania must last at least one week. That's important. Remember that. So right over here for bipolar 2, you're going to need to have at least one hypomanic episode and one major depressive episode. So in order to have a bipolar 2, you would need to have a major depressive episode. So that could be at any time. So you could be depressed and then go to hypomania. That's bipolar 2. You could be hypomanic and then become depressed. That's bipolar 2. Period of hypomania must last for at least four days. Psychothymia is going to be another type of bipolar disorder. So the criteria for major depressive episode, the criteria for mania, hypomania is never actually met. But with a cyclothymic disorder, you're going to have more chronic hypomanic and depressive symptoms without ever meeting the threshold for full diagnosis of bipolar 1 or bipolar 2. So for example, when we're looking at cyclothymic disorder, um, this is going to require the symptoms, the subthreshold symptoms, to last for a period of at least two years. So these symptoms must be present for at least half the time during the, that two-year period, and these, can, these symptoms cannot go away or remit for more than two months for this to be considered cyclothymia. These symptoms do cause distress and impairment. So you have somebody who seems depressed, but they're not meeting criteria for a depressive episode. And we have somebody who seems manic or hypomanic, but they don't meet criteria for manic or hypomanic episode. So remember before we were talking about how sub-threshold levels of symptoms can still cause significant levels of distress and impairment. So psychothymia, that's an example of that. So here's a little review here for you. Remember, it's going to be at least two years. I have some little uh, words down here. So we have symptoms, SX, TX treatment, DX diagnosis, RX prescription. You might see these coming up later. That's what that means. Symptom, treatment, diagnosis, prescription. Remember that just in case. So remember, you're going to need at least two years with numerous periods of hypomanic symptoms and periods of depressed symptoms that are sub-threshold. These symptoms must be present for at least half the time during that two-year period, and they cannot remit for more than two months. These symptoms do cause significant levels of distress and impairment. So now we're going to have some review questions here. All right, so let's look at the first one. So Billy Bob has had three manic episodes throughout his lifetime, but has never been depressed. What is his diagnosis? Is it A, bipolar 1, B, bipolar 2, C, cyclothymic disorder, D, schizophrenia, E, chronic mania disorder? It is A, bipolar 1 disorder. He has manic episodes. Mania, bipolar 1. Sandra Sue has had seven depressive episodes and two hypomanic episodes. She also experiences hallucinations and delusions during her mood episodes. Does she have A, bipolar 1, B, bipolar 2, C, cyclothymic disorder, D, unipolar depression, or E, double depression? B, bipolar 2 disorder. How do you know? Well, she has had seven depressive episodes, and two hypomanic episodes. Remember, hypomania, bipolar 2. Understand 
that bipolar 1 is always associated with manic episodes and bipolar 2 is always associated with hypomanic episodes. Okay, so sometimes people get confused. They said, well, she had three hypomanic episodes and one manic episode, so obviously she has bipolar 2. That would be wrong. The second you see mania, you are looking at bipolar 1. You could have 47 hypomanic episodes, 89 depressive episodes, and one manic episode. And guess what you have? bipolar one. So just keep that in mind. So why do they call it bipolar? Well, bi means two. Polar comes from the word polis, which means end or point. So you have two points. Bipolar. So in bipolar disorder, um, the mood experiences actually vary. So you can often have, you know, long periods of very low mood, but it's not actually necessary for bipolar disorder. You are going to have high periods of energy and euphoria. So you need that hypomania mania for bipolar disorder. Mood shifts in bipolar disorder tend to occur over the course of weeks or months, not within a day or two. So you need to pay close attention to changes in mood symptoms. This is going to be extremely important for someone with bipolar disorder to prevent relapses in the future. Now, some people might talk about, oh, yeah, he's so bipolar, he'll switch his mood three times in a day. That's not bipolar disorder. Remember, these periods of mood for bipolar 1, because remember, bipolar 1 has mania, you need to have that manic episode has to last for seven days. Not seven minutes, not seven hours, seven days. Then when it comes to hypomania, hypomania for bipolar 2, that hypomanic episode has to last for at least four days. Not four minutes, not four hours, four days. The next time you hear somebody say, well, they have so many mood swings in a the day, they're totally bipolar. That's disparaging the people with bipolar. That's the stigma of mental health. Don't use those terms. And in a related note, we'll talk about more about that with OCD. A little bit of a bonus point to drive home here. You cannot have a unipolar mood disorder at the same time as a bipolar mood disorder. So you will either have a unipolar mood disorder or a bipolar mood disorder. I want you to think about that. Think about that. Just think about that. All right, so here's a graph right here to help you visualize the differences between major depressive disorder and bipolar disorder. So right over here, you're going to see major depressive disorder, right? So major depressive disorder is composed of numerous major depressive episodes. As you can see, none of these episodes remits for more than a two-month period. So this individual has major depressive disorder. So take a look right there. Okay. Now over here, you're going to see bipolar disorder. So you see we both have major depressive episodes and manic episodes, right? Neither of which remit for more than two months. So right over here, you have somebody who has major depressive episodes and manic episodes. So that's going to be bipolar disorder. Here's a bonus question. If someone has major depressive episodes and manic episodes, which bipolar disorder do they have? Bipolar 1 or bipolar 2? Oh yeah, it's bipolar one because they have manic episodes. Major depressive disorders consist of major depressive episodes. Each of these lasts for at least two weeks and there's not going to be any manic or hypomanic episodes within a major depressive disorder. For bipolar disorder, this includes manic episodes and it might include depressive episodes, like in this example, depending on the bipolar disorder. All right, so now we're going to talk about family studies, twin studies, genetic factors when it comes to bipolar disorders. So family studies and twin studies suggest that there's a stronger genetic influence for bipolar disorder than for major depressive disorder. So for example, the concordance rate for monozygotic twins is 0.43. And the concordance rate for dizygotic twins is 0.06. So as you can see with this difference here, just how high the concordance rate is for monozygotic twins, we see that there's some form of genetic influence here. Now, if you have a first-degree relative with bipolar disorder, then you will have a 5 to 12% chance of having bipolar disorder. And you'll also have a 20 to 25% chance of having any mood disorder. Now, children 
of a parent with bipolar disorder are at a particularly greater risk for developing bipolar disorder. So they're actually going to be at four times the risk compared to ch children of parents without bipolar disorder. So there's going to be a large proportion of genetic overlap between major depressive disorder and schizophrenia. So we see right here, there are strong genetic factors. So let's talk about the etiology of bipolar disorder from the biological perspective. So, so like depression, bipolar disorder is associated with decreased serotonin. However, it is also associated with increased dopamine, which we mentioned before is a neurotransmitter linked to pleasure as well as like reward seeking behavior. Think of how that maps onto the symptoms. So it is also, bipolar disorder is also associated with elevated glutamate, which can cause the overexcitation. There are also differences in areas of the brain, such as the amygdala, which is the brain area associated with emotion. The prefrontal cortex, which is the brain area associated with impulse control. And the basal ganglia, which is the brain area associated with reward. So dysfunctions in these brain areas might lead to an increased risk of bipolar disorder. So there's a lot of different psychosocial factors that play a role in the development of bipolar disorder. So for example, we have stress generation. So similarly to what we talked about with major depressive disorder, stress generation can contribute to the onset or the maintenance of bipolar disorder. So let's look at goal dysregulation. An individual who has a bipolar or is biologically predisposed to bipolar disorder might be more reactive to rewards and successes. So in other words, people with bipolar disorder might be viewed as reward sensitive. And in fact, mania has been found to be more likely after life events involving goal attainment. Now, sleep and sleep schedule disruption have also been implicated in the onset of manic and hypomanic episodes. So specifically think about sleep deprivation. This has been shown to predict mania symptoms. Even things like exposure to bright light can trigger manic or mania symptoms. And disruption of the daily circadian rhythm and social rhythms can also lead to disruption or can lead to the onset of a manic episode. So let's look at um, circadian rhythm. Who knows what a circadian rhythm is? That's right. It's your sleep-wake cycle. So one important aspect of relapse prevention for individuals with bipolar disorder is to maintain regularity or like a daily routine. So people with bipolar tend to be sensitive to changes in their routine. So your circadian rhythm, which is your 24-hour internal clock, is running in the background and your brain cycles between sleepiness and alertness at regular intervals. So disruptions in the sleep-wake cycle could cause some problems. So typically the age of onset for bipolar disorder is between 18 and 22 years old. There's not going to be any sex differences between bipolar 1. However, bipolar 2 is more common among females. And this age of onset applies for either the first manic episode or the first depressive episode. Now look at bipolar 2 disorder. The onset for bipolar 2 disorder is typically a little later, sometimes in the mid-20s. And this illness is most often first diagnosed as a depressive disorder. And then it's not really recognized as being bipolar 2 until a hypomanic episode occurs. Now, when it comes to the length of time between episodes, this varies and can often be very difficult to predict. So the average duration of a manic episode is anywhere from two to three months. And patients with bipolar 2 disorder um, tend to have shorter and less severe episodes. Now, the number of lifetime episodes, this is both for um, hypomanic and depressive episodes, tends to be higher in bipolar 2 disorders. Now, 40 to 50% of patients are able to re achieve a sustained recovery, but almost all individuals who have one manic episode go on to have at least one other mood episode at some point in their life. And by mood episode, that could be a depressive episode, a hypomanic episode, or another manic episode. Now, there is a 15 times greater risk for completing suicide compared to people without bipolar disorder.
Now, past suicide attempts and percent days spent depressing the year are associated with the greatest risk for completed suicide. So let's talk about some interventions for bipolar disorder. So let's, let's start with medication. So there are a variety of interventions for bipolar disorder. So when looking at medications, one medication that is commonly associated with bipolar disorder is going to be lithium. So this primary, this medication right here, the primary function is to stabilize the mood shifts. Now, patients on lithium must be very careful because lithium is actually very toxic in high doses. Now, other medications have also been found to work for patients with bipolar disorder. And this could speak to the similarity um, in the biology between bipolar and other disorders. So keep in mind that the medication regimen for any disorder requires fine tuning to find out what works best for the individuals. So unfortunately, between 40 and 60% of patients with bipolar disorder are non-compliant with medication. And this is likely due to side effects um, caused by the medication. So these side effects are sleepiness, hand tremors, nausea, and loss of interest in sex. Now, the nausea and the loss of interest in sex, the, these uh, side effects are actually similar to the side effects found in antidepressants. Now, right over here, I have a list of some other medications that are prescribed to individuals with bipolar disorder. This is um, in addition to lithium. We have antipsychotics, other mood stabilizers, and anti-seizure medications. These have also been found effective for individuals with bipolar disorder. Now, for bipolar disorder, the best plan is usually to combine both psychotherapy and medication. And this is due to the um, the rates of non-compliance with taking your medication and also the severity of the episodes. So doing both psychotherapy and medication, combine those together can lead to the best outcomes. This combination of psychotherapy and medication helps to reduce non-compliance. So it's gonna reduce the rate at which patients stop you know, taking their medication. And then also this might lead to patients achieving um, more like a more complete remission, like a full remission of their symptoms. This of course is compared to taking medication alone. Now psychotherapy is also going to help clients understand and accept the need for their treatment when it comes to their medication and also allow them to cope with the impact of this order on their lives. Now, when you take medication by itself, it doesn't necessarily allow you to adjust or cope with the impact of the disorder on your life because rather than you building the skills that you would need to cope with your symptoms, you just get rid of the symptoms with the medication. One of the most popular and we're going to talk about that more um, as we go through the semester. But there is an argument to be made on being very uh, careful or use medication sparingly, um, especially when you're talking about issues with becoming habituated to the medication rather than learning how to process and deal with some of the emotions and experiences associated with some of these uh, mental health disorders. So. When we talk about bipolar, um, you know, sometimes medication is really good for stabilizing an individual. However, you also want to make sure that you are helping them learn other kinds of adaptive strategies to try to help themselves, uh, you know, with what's going on in their, in their brain. So, you know, my mother and sister are both uh, type 2 bipolar, and so there are periods of time when they don't need medication, and there's periods of time when they do. and They've also, you know, spent a lot of time in therapy, learning skills and strategies of how to manage their symptoms without medication. But it's always important to have a team of people helping you out. It's always important to have a team of people uh, giving you second opinions and advice when it comes to your treatment. And so as a clinician, when you go out and start diagnosing people or prescribing the medication, make sure that you are looking at, you know, the whole picture and making sure that they are fully supported. All right. Interventions for bipolar disorder is going to be CBT. So that's cognitive behavioral therapy. CBT is going to be very important in helping the individual monitor their mood and restructure their inaccurate thought patterns. So mood monitoring basically involves a process um, of an individual keeping track of their mood so that they can notice when there are any changes present that might be, you know, indicative of an oncoming episode. So this will allow them to address these feelings early on. When we look at psychoeducation, this is going to be the process of, of providing information to patients 
and to their families to help them gain a better understanding of the different components of the illness. So this could actually help families by helping them to identify symptoms of the bipolar disorder. So psychoeducation can be very um, helpful for families because the symptoms of bipolar disorder can be related to a lot of strain within families. So family-focused therapy is going to try to address these issues and help try to like work to restore um, a healthy and supportive home environment, which can be very important for the outcomes of the client. So the educating these family members about the disease and how to cope with its symptoms is going to be a major component of the treatment. So working through these problems in the home and providing communication is going to be a big focus of the treatment as well. And this could actually reduce stress in the home. We know that reducing stress can limit episodes. So let's look at IPSRT, which is interpersonal and social rhythm therapy. So IPSRT um, postulates that stressful life events, um, disruptions in circadian rhythms, um, disruptions in personal relationships, and conflicts arising out of difficulty in social adjustment often lead to relapse. So individuals in this kind of treatment are going to work with their clinicians to try to solve interpersonal problems and maintain a daily rhythm. So this daily rhythm includes things like getting to sleep on time, waking up on time, eating on time, and exercising regularly. This kind of rhythm right here can actually increase the quality of life, reduce symptoms, and help to prevent relapse. So the focus is going to be on identifying themes of social stressors and increasing and maintaining the overall regularity in the individual's daily life. DBT is dialectical behavioral therapy. So this is a comprehensive cognitive behavioral treatment that has been found especially effective for those with suicidal or other severely dysfunctional behaviors. The research has shown that DBT is effective in reducing suicidal behavior, psychiatric hospitalization, treatment dropout, substance abuse, anger, and other interpersonal difficulties. One way to think about DBT is as like a supercharged form of CBT. Now keep in mind that all of these interventions are focused on symptom monitoring and relapse prevention. That is the goal of the interventions for bipolar disorder is going to be symptom monitoring and relapse prevention. So this is achieved through medication compliance, involving the family in treatment, identifying and reducing triggers, and helping the individual recognize changes to prevent relapse. So let's do a quick little um, summary here of these treatments. So we have CBT. The goal here is going to be monitoring mood and structuring inaccurate uh, thought patterns. We have psychoeducation, so this is for the family or the individual. We're looking at things like regulating sleep, work, and socialization, identifying and reducing triggers, managing stress, reducing inf uh, interpersonal conflict, avoiding substance abuse, and also monitoring and preventing relapse. So we have um, interpersonal and social uh, rhythms therapy. So this is going to be making sure that we don't have any disruptions in circadian rhythms, that we avoid stressful events, and we repair you know, personal relationships, so that way we can avoid relapse. And then we have DBT, which is going to be especially effective for those with suicidal and other um, dysfunctional behaviors. And this is actually a supercharged form of CBT. All right, so that's going to be it for um, week four, Mood Disorders 2. Um, go ahead and do your readings. Make sure you do your reading questions. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns, send me an email. Please make sure that you're watching the lectures and you're reading the reading the syllabus. Uh, make sure you do your participation points. If you have any problems at all, go ahead and contact me, wjv3 at illinois.edu. All right, I'll see you later. All right, so that's the end of this week. So it was a little bit of a shorter video. Now remember, we're going to be going into a lot of uh, a lot of the categories right now for the, uh, the, the disorders in the DSM-5. So I would encourage you to go to the online DSM-5 chapters I posted on Compass. I encourage you to use the link that's on Compass as well to go there yourself. Make sure you have your library account registered. Go down to little the little pink uh, red boxes there in, um, in the chapters and look at all the diagnostic criteria for the different disorders. Now, the disorders that aren't on, that aren't covered in lecture, are not going to be on the quiz. So there's a lot of disorders in DSM-5 that we're not covering. So if it's not in 
the lecture, it's not going to be on the quiz. But if you feel like you want to just investigate what's available in the DSM-5, feel free to. I also want to encourage everybody to take the reading questions pretty seriously. I also want to encourage people to, you know, do the participation points. And I'll, and we just finished quiz number one, and I noticed there was a lot of people who just didn't do the quiz. So I encourage you to take every quiz. So if you skip a quiz, that becomes your lowest quiz score. So now there are a large number of people who have the lowest quiz scores being a zero, and you're not going to be able to make it up. So I would encourage you to take the quizzes. Now, if you're having any issues accessing content on Compass, you should tell me ahead of time. Um, don't wait till after a due date has passed to say, oh, well, I couldn't access the content. Uh, you should be checking Compass pretty regularly. You have a syllabus that's always being updated. So if you go to the bottom of the syllabus, there is the schedule of, of, of assignments that are due. If you see that there's some kind of issue between the assignments in the syllabus and the assignments visible to you on Compass, you need to let me know immediately. I don't have the ability to see what you're seeing. I can do like a student preview mode, but that's just a general thing. If you're having a specific issue, I can't see what kind of specific issue you're having. You're gonna to have to like send me a screenshot or something. Of course, do this before it's due. Don't send me screenshots after it's due. Um, so let's, you know, if you're having any issues accessing the content, if you have any issues at all, you know, let me know. Send me an email. If you're going to send me an email, please put PSYC 238 in the subject. Right there in the subject line, put PSYC, um, yeah, PSYC 238. The reason why, I get a lot of emails and I want to respond to your emails. So if you put PSYC 238 into the subject line of your email, it really helps me out because I can sort all the emails real quickly and get back to you right on time. I get a lot of emails at random times of the day. Um, some of them say quiz, some say questions, some say thing. I mean, you'd be surprised some of the subject lines. Just as like a, a tip, um, a tip. If you're ever sending an email to somebody, make sure the subject line has like has some kind of contextual clues to what the email's about, you know? So if you're emailing your apartment, you just say, apartment 472 issues with heater and then write your email the subject line is there for a reason use the subject line question sure that's cool and everything but you know just put psyc 238 question about the lecture or something like that i don't care at least put psyc 238 in there somewhere or at least put psyc 238 somewhere in the body of the email but no please use the subject line too like sometimes i get these random emails with these weird subject lines and these this weird content oh it's from one of my students so i have 100 students please help yourself out you know if you if you sent me an email and you didn't hear back from me it's probably because you didn't put psyc 2380 in the title i get thousands of emails a day i'm not joking um as a gra as an employee of the university and a graduate student i get tons of emails so just help me out help your other professors out too well i'm not a professor but you know help your other instructors out you know put some kind of title in the subject line to help them out you know, to orient them to what's going on. Or maybe that's not an issue for your other professors. Who knows? All right. So that's going to be it for today. I'm going to go ahead and end this video. If you have any questions, once again, send me an email. Come to office hours. Starting on Monday, we're going to have our in-person discussion sessions. So that's Monday and Tuesday. All the hours are on Compass. All the hours are in the syllabus. The sign-up link is on Compass. The sign-up link is in the syllabus please check that out. If you have questions about course content, please feel free to contact me as soon as you have that course content question. All right. Have a great day.